You're like, what the heck is going on with this seating in here? This is weird. It is strange. Uh, and what I was sharing with my, my new friend Lila over here was that the reason we did that is because sometimes, sometimes people fall asleep in church. <laughs> and sometimes, and sometimes, I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes we even see people picking their noses a little bit. And so this is a new accountability model we've sent up so that whatever you're doing anywhere, there's somebody looking right down the barrel of whatever you're up to. I'm just kidding. We had, a, we had a little worship gathering here for some of the pastors in the community on Friday. And so we'd set up the chairs this way. And we were thinking about moving back to Rose. But you're like, you know what? What the heck? Let's try something a little different and see how it goes. I asked Lila. She said, this is, she, said she likes this better than Rose. So we might just stick with this. All right? I don't know. We'll see what happens. Uh, I'd like for us all to just remember together about why it is that we're united here in God's name, all right? In the last chapter of the book of Matthew, Jesus said to the people, he said, go and make disciples of all the nations. And he said, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He said, teach them to obey everything I've commanded them. That's what we call the Great Commission, okay? Now, sometimes when we're involved with church, we can get this misconception that church is about us, We can get this misconception that church is about our little thing here. And sometimes we can forget that Jesus has a kingdom that he's building all over the world and that our first citizenship is to his kingdom. Sometimes we forget about that. Right now, Brandon Blair, one of the guys from our staff, he's actually over serving at another church. It's a church that's without a pastor right now, and so our church has come alongside them to provide pulpit supply, pulpit support. Right? And God's blessed us so richly with a group of leaders and teachers and preachers that we can come alongside of other congregations and serve and help in that way. That's a small example of the way that we can be a kingdom-first ministry. If we weren't, we'd just say, no, we want everybody here. We want every seat in our building full, full and we'll let other people worry about their stuff. Right? But that's not the kind of church God's called us to be. He's called us to be a kingdom-minded church, and that's who we are. Right? So I'm about to take a risk with you guys. I'm about to take a risk. All right, now I know my vote comes up, and what, so we're in, we're, what was the countdown on that, Mary? Are we four months left, maybe five months until I get my vote? So hopefully you guys will forget about this risk by the time that comes up. All right. I had a text message from a, from a, mess, from a member of our staff, and he said, I've got a stupid idea. Just, kids don't say stupid, it's a bad word. But that's what he said. He said, this is a really dumb idea. We shouldn't ever do it. And he said, we should do an outreach to the community. And we said, well, that's a bad idea. It's a bad idea because we've got a coronavirus going around. It's a bad idea because people might be put at risk. All these kind of things. Bad idea, bad idea, bad idea. Well, the Holy Spirit has not let up on me and on some of the other folks in our staff about this outreach thing. And so we're going to take a risk. We're going to take a risk. Okay? And this is because we are a kingdom-minded church that we're going to take this risk. How many of you know what Mother's Day is for? It's for mothers, right? So what would a really unwise young pastor do on a Mother's Day? A very unwise young pastor would plan an outreach event on Mother's Day. An unwise young pastor would say, we're going to take a Sunday that normally we use to honor the people within our own congregation to take care of ourselves, and instead, we're going to reach into the community instead. It's an unwise idea because it's calling for a sacrifice. Normally, the normal pattern for Christians and for Americans is to be me-focused, to be self-focused. But we're going to be trying something new. We're going to try to do an outreach into the community on Mother's Day. Okay? So here's what we're going to need. For those of you that are willing to take a risk alongside of us, we're going to need a group of individuals that are willing to pull an all-nighter on Saturday night before Mother's Day. Okay? We're going to be bringing charcoal grills in, smokers, all these kinds of things, and we're going to low and slow a whole bunch of barbecue meat. All right? We're going to pull an all-nighter. We're going to be out here doing it. And we're going to need another team that's going to make like sides and sweet tea and set up and all those kinds of things. We have another team that's going to be getting the word out to our local neighborhood, going to be telling people about what's going on here. We're going to have another team that's whole thing is to set up and tear down, okay? Now, look, I realize that when I'm asking people to do something on Mother's Day, that's a big risk, right? And it's kind of a foolish decision that a young pastor would try to make, right? 
So if we show up here, there's only a couple of us here, I'll have nobody to blame but myself. But what I'm asking, what I'm asking is that each of you, each of you will spend time in prayer asking the Holy Spirit, is this a Sunday, a Mother's Day, that you're calling me to have a sacrifice, to make a sacrifice? Instead of going out to eat, instead of going out to dinner, instead I'm going to hang around at the church and serve barbecue to other people. Instead of sleeping in late and doing that kind of thing, no, I'm going to actually pull an all-nighter and come out and cook and do these kinds of things. Instead of hiding, instead of hiding, I might actually go to some of my neighbors and say, hey, we've got this thing going on. If we know a single mom that doesn't have, you know, she's got three or four kids and she, she doesn't know what she's going to do for a Mother's Day meal, she needs to know about our thing and come out and have a meal with our people, okay? I know this is a risk. I know it's kind of a dumb idea, okay? But my friends, 18 months now, we're kind of into this COVID thing. And the thing that's been on my heart has been, there have been people that have been living and dying and going to an eternity, some of them separated from Christ, regardless of whether it is a coronavirus or not. Right? And we can't hang out forever waiting for this thing to blow over before we get on mission again. All right? So if you're viewing this online or here in the room, I want to say next Sunday, next Sunday what we're going to do is after the service, we're going to break up into teams and we're going to plan this thing out. I know we're on short notice, so it's going to kind of be an all hands on deck kind of thing to sort this out. So next Sunday, after the message, we're going to spend some time uh, breaking up into groups and planning this out. We've got a sign-up sheet in the hallway. If you need a boot and scoot today, just put your name down with your phone number on one of the teams that we have there. And then we got some invites printed up that you can grab. And I've got a little information sheet. So if you're a barbecuer, we're going to need you to bring your own meat, bring your own uh, barbecue sauce, your own tools. We've got a little list there for that. All right, have I said enough about this? Okay. I'm pretty fired up, and I'm hoping that some of you guys will be willing to take a risk with me. The second thing I want to mention is we, have, we are revered around this place for providing suckers. You know, like candy on a stick? So usually after the service, what happens is the little ones will go run in, and they'll grab a piece of candy from the, uh, the secretary's office. Well, far be it from us to ever give away something for free. We're going to be putting kids to work. A new tradition we're going to be starting here is, we're not going to start it this week, but we'll be starting it over the next few weeks, is we're going to actually have a memory verse. We're going to call it a sucker quiz. A quiz for suckers. You can call it either way. But the kid will have a memory verse, and they'll say, hey, what's John 3.16? Rattle back off. Here's your sucker. All right, sorry, kids. We take everything fun. We, we make it hard, and we make it work. But this whole idea is that we want our kids to know God's word, to embrace God's word, and be all about it. All right, so be looking out for the sucker quiz. Those commercials done, could we all stand together? We're going to worship God together. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good to see you, brother. It's good to be together today. Okay, so we learned this new song last week, so you guys should have it down pat. So I want to hear some really loud singing to the Lord, okay? I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance.
We 
have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words for a moment and just thank the Lord for all that he's done to it for us we we're here this morning and there's so much going on around us so let's just take just a couple of minutes to just thank the Lord for the opportunity to gather today the opportunity to worship him Father God we love you with everything that we are and our sole purpose of coming together here this morning is to honor and to worship you. To move all of the attention that we place on ourselves and the things that go on around us to take this time to offer ourselves to you as an act of worship. You are amazing. You are marvelous. You are wonderful. We are privileged to be in your presence. 
Father God, I just pray that you will move in our midst in a powerful way. That you will speak to the hearts of those that need to be spoken to today, which reality is that's each and every one of us. Because we all find ourselves in different places as we come in here today. And yet in each place, our greatest need is you. So, Father, we lift before you, even now we lift Brandon before you as he probably now is just starting to wrap up his message. And I pray that the hearts of people will be changed at Long Lake. Then we lift up Pastor Luke as he's about to stand before your people and share what you've laid on his heart as well. Lord, I pray that you would open the hearts of the receivers, that you will help us to focus completely on what you have to say to us today and then not just be hearers of that, but may we receive it and go from this place and live it for you. We lift up those that are hurting today. We lift up those that are experiencing loss. So much pain so much sorrow, and I pray that you will come and fill hearts with joy. We offer this day to you. We ask that you would do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we could ever imagine or think. And it truly is our, our desire to honor and to glorify you. Holy Spirit, fill this place that, God, you would be glorified. And we thank you in advance for all you're going to do and give you praise. For it's in the matchless name of Jesus we pray all of these things. Amen. Amen. I got to say, everybody, there is nothing cooler than having little ones in the worship service with us. I know maybe for some of us, maybe it's a little hard for me to focus, maybe a little hard for me to pay attention, but here's the thing that we know. There's not a difference in God's eyes between children and grown-ups. We're just disciples at different stages along the game. So our kids are going to learn. They'll learn how to sit still. They'll learn how to sing. They'll learn how to pray. And what we're going to say is that we are so glad that children are here. It's a dark day for a church when there's no little ones running around and yelling and causing noise and doing all those kinds of the dark day for the church when that happens so praise god that that is not what has been happening here kids we're going to keep you in here for a couple more minutes because you know every t- chance i get i want to show you what it's like to grow up as a disciple of jesus and part of that means that you're going to learn to grow up to read god's word and share it with other people okay so today we're going to have nate kuntz our resident pastor is going to be reading the text now kids do you ever get nervous when you have to get in front of a big group of people and say something? I know you don't, big boy. <laughs> for, uh, for some of us, it can be a little hard to get up in front of people and talk. So what I want you to do is pay close attention. Kids, can you lean forward like this? Can you lean forward like this, kids? Further! Can you look like this? Can you put your hand over your eyes like this? Okay. I want you to do that and watch as Nate reads the text from this message and shares something with us. Can you do that? All right. Awesome. So today the text comes from Exodus 3, chapter 3, starting in verse 10. We're going to read to the end of the chapter, so stick with me. Well, this is weird having a little circle. It's pretty cool. So now, go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, 
What is his name? Then what shall I tell him? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. A land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. So Moses is, we're in the middle of a dialogue between Moses and God. And so Moses, we're getting his response now to what God has already, God has come to him and said, I want you to go to Pharaoh. So now we get Moses' first two responses. At first he goes, why me? How am I qualified to go to Pharaoh? And God immediately puts that to rest. Well, I'm with you, so I I got your back. But I really like this second. I can relate to this second uh, rebuttal, if you want to call it that, from Moses. He goes, okay, so say that I do go. Say that I do go, and I do talk to the Israelites, and I tell them that you sent me. And they ask me this question. What is his name? What, What should I tell them? I don't know. I don't have the answer to that question. And so when I was in high school, I was told that I would be great in ministry because I have the personality for it, and I love people, and I love God. But I felt unprepared, and I was scared because I was worried someone would ask me the question about God that I couldn't answer. I didn't have the answer. But unlike Moses... I held on to that, and I did not go to God and say, hey, I don't know more about you. Can you tell me more about you? So what I love about Moses is right here, he's saying, God, who are you? I know that you're the the God of my fathers. That's awesome. But I want to know you deeper than that. I want to know you on a whole other level. And the amazing thing is God answers him and responds in the next couple of verses and reveals himself to them. He tells him exactly what he's to say. He tells him his name. He responds to him because God delights in revealing himself to us. We just have to ask. We just have to be wanting to go deeper with him. And so I ask you today, and I ask myself this question. I'm I'm going to start asking myself this question more often than I do already. When was the last time that you genuinely asked God, to reveal more of himself to you. Who are you, God? I want to know you on a much deeper level than I already do. That's what Moses was doing. And I want to start doing that on a more regular basis. Thank you, guys. Well done, Nate. Well done.
See, everybody, anybody can go to God's word, draw truth from it, and share it with other people. Kids, you can see that Nate's done this. He's, he, I know he's taller than most of us, but uh, any of you can go to God's word, draw truth from it, and share it. Kids, can I ask you, War, one favor before you leave? Do you guys, do you guys know the words to the song, Happy Birthday? There it is. We need to sing happy birthday to Serenity because she's turning 18 and her mom told us that. So we're going to sing happy birthday to Serenity. Kids, can you help us? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Serenity. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> This may be the last message I preach because I'm pretty sure Serenity's going to murder me after service. But kids, you are dismissed. Thank you so much for being with us. It's so cool when we dismiss the kids to see a whole pack of kids running off together. It's wonderful to see. So how many of you, when you were kids, remember the game Simon Says? Does anybody remember that game? All right, we're going to play Simon Says. Everybody stand up. You all lose. I didn't say Simon Says. Gotcha. Ha! When I was a kid playing Simon Says, I was kidding, we're not going to play Simon Says. When I, when I was a kid playing Simon Says, uh, one of the questions that came up to me was, well, who the heck is Simon anyways? Like, why do we care what Simon says? I was a little bit of a rebel as a kid, okay? So you'd say, jump, and I wouldn't say how high. I'd say, well, you jump first. We'll see how it goes, and if it feels like a move to do so, maybe I'll jump with you, right? His game Simon says, who the heck is Simon anyways? This might be a good metaphor for this sermon for today, okay? So as we look at this passage, we're in Exodus. We're in chapter 3 of Exodus, and Moses is going to bring a series of objections to the Lord about why the time is not right and why he is not the right person. Now, if you've been in church for any amount of time, you've probably heard many sermons about the different objections and why they're offered. Okay? But there's a pastor whom I respect very much named Matt Chandler, and he preached a sermon one time. It was about David, and it was about the, the, the story of David and Goliath. And what he says is most people get that story wrong. When they hear the story of David and Goliath, they start applying to themselves as being David. Well, you've got a Goliath in your life, you've got to take a rock, it'll knock out David, these kinds of things, right? But what Matt Chandler said in this message was that, actually, in most cases, we're not David. In most cases, we are not David. We're the people of Israel hiding behind David as David goes and does the Lord's work, right? And in this story of Moses, we're going to be careful about jumping straight to trying to applying the advice that, that maybe people would come from this passage to Moses, okay? How many of you have before heard the phrase, um, he drove an organization into the ground? Anybody heard that phrase before? How about this one? Um, the new leader came in and changed things too fast. How many of you have heard that before? How many of you have heard, well, a new leader came in and she had a great vision and things started going awesome. How many of you have heard that before? I've heard that before. Um, people talk a lot about leaders and the impact they have on organizations. There's a very popular leader uh, named John Maxwell. He's written a lot of books on leadership. And one of his books was the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. He has a law in there called the Law of the Lid. Has anybody heard of the Law of the Lid before? A few of us. Okay, so the Law of the Lid is very simple. What it says is, let's just say that right here is zero. So zero is the worst leader that's ever lived. So like the Grinch, or somebody like that. That's, that's the zero-level leader. And then level 10 leader would be Jesus. So Jesus is the greatest leader who's ever lived. What John Maxwell identified was that whatever level leader you are, your organization will never grow past that. Okay, so he said that if you're a level four leader, if you're a level four leader, you are the lid of your organization. Your organization will never get past level four. Until you're able to raise your level as a leader, the organization will not grow. Right? Now, when we went through these questions, he drove the organization into the ground. She brought a new vision. It's a way that we all kind of know and understand that a leader does impact how an organization goes. But may I suggest to you that the passage of Scripture today is going to say that it's more complicated than that. 
You remember from last week when we were talking about who Moses was to the people of Israel. Remember, if I came to you and said, who is the first president of the United States? You'd say, if we said, who is the leader who freed the enslaved people in America? We would say, if we were going to say, who is the gentlest, nicest man anybody ever knew? We might have some debate about that, but I said probably Mr. Rogers is maybe the nicest person we could probably think of in American history, right? We'd say, well, who is the lawgiver? We might say the Founding Fathers or Anton Scalia. If we were to say, who was the holiest person you could ever think of? Maybe you'd say Billy Graham. But remember, we said that if you asked the Jewish people all of these questions, they'd have the same answer for all of them. It would be Moses, 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 Moses. So John Maxwell tells us that the law of the lid says that if you're a four leader, you're never going to grow the organization past that. May I suggest to you, but that's not always the case. Because the people of Israel, in retrospect, look back and say, yeah, the Moses is the best there ever was. And even Moses didn't think he could lead the people of Israel. Because I believe that when John Maxwell says that the law of the lid, the question is, does the level of your leadership set the level of the organization? I might say that it might be how you are perceived sets the level of the organization. How you are perceived sets the level of the organization. Let's look at the passage. We're in Moses chapter 3. If you didn't see last week's sermon, I encourage you to go on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, We cover 3, 1 to 10 on there, and that's really foundational to understanding this one. But here we are in verse, verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? May I suggest to you that Moses isn't as inept as sometimes we paint him to be. We say, well, of course you're good enough. You're Moses. You're the great leader. We've read the whole thing. We have the benefit of hindsight. And we look back and say, well, of course you can do it, particularly if God's on your side. May I suggest to you that Moses has a very adept perception of people. You see, when he asks the question, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He's actually repeating to God something that has already happened in his story. Let's look back. Let's look back one chapter in chapter two. So Moses, remember, he was raised in the Egyptian royalty. Okay. Now, the oral tradition that Jewish rabbis have about Moses was that he was actually a military leader. Within, we don't have that in the scripture, but the oral tradition says that he was a military leader. Okay. Now, listen what happens. We're back in Exodus chapter 2. And we're in verse 11. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Now listen what happens next. We're in verse 13. The next day, he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? What does the man say? Who are you? When Moses says to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? He's direct quoting this other guy that when he tried to bring justice, when he tried to bring reconciliation between the people, they said, Who are you? Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? When Moses looks down the barrel of potentially leading the Jewish people out, he's like, I already tried that. And the first thing they wondered was, who are you? Now, my friends, because we have retrospect, we can look back and say that Moses is the greatest there ever was. But even when he started, the people wouldn't follow him. The fact that he was an excellent leader didn't make any difference because it wasn't how effective of a leader he was, it was how effective people perceived him to be. So when we say, does the level of your leadership set the level of the organization, or is it how you are perceived that sets the level of the organization, I'm going to suggest to you that it's how you're perceived. Because when Moses is asked by God to lead the people, his first question, his first objection is, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? 
there's actually, he's saying it politely because he's doing it in the form of a question. But what he's actually saying here is, God, do you know these people? If I'm honest, my friends, I can be very difficult to lead at times. Okay? I was joking with the Simon Says game about saying, well, who the heck is Simon anyways? But when I was a resident assistant in college, I was a difficult person to lead because I always had lots of questions and lots of suggestions about how management could improve the way of doing things. When my mother tried to set rules and instructions for me, I had a lot of ideas about ways that she could improve her management as well. It's been something that's followed me everywhere I've went. I've had ideas about how people should manage and how should supervise, and I'll be honest, I'm very difficult to lead. Particularly when I was between the ages of 16 and 24, I was very difficult to lead. Um, Because I would have a lot of, I would wonder, so who's Simon anyways? Okay, you're the manager, great. Somebody gave you a little placard to put on your desk that says you're in charge. That doesn't mean you know anything. That was my attitude a lot of the time. In fact, in the last organization I worked at, the uh, senior pastor, we, we had a good conversation. I was being a jerk in a meeting and just being difficult to lead. And he comes and he puts his arm around me and he's like, you know, Luke, you know, you're, you're right about what you're saying. I'm like, you're right. But would you rather people know you're right or influence the outcome? And I was like, that's a good point. I can be very difficult to lead because if I don't respect somebody, if I don't think that they're worthy of my respect, I won't follow them. All right, that's, that's how I am. Maybe some of you are different. I like my leaders like I like my coffee. I like them sweet, I like them bold, and I like them hot. And what do I mean by that? I like my, le- my leaders sweet. I like them to have a charisma about them. I like him to be a person that has a winsomeness about them. I want them to treat me like a peer, and I want, them, I want them to bring me in. I want my leader to be sweet. I want my leader to be bold. They have to be decisive. They have to know what they want, and they have to be able to convince me that what they want makes sense. And they have to be hot. I'm not talking about like physically appearance hot. What it means is that they have to be on a hot streak. They have to be able to show me that they've successfully led other things before. If they can do those things, if they can be sweet, if they can be bold, and they can be hot, I'll follow them. But if they're not, I won't. And so when Moses, when he says to God, he says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He's pointing at what happened before, and he's saying, and he's communicating, they will only listen to someone they respect. They will only listen to someone they respect. Now, the fact is that Moses really is as close to a 10 leader as what we're going to find. And it's really true that God himself has come and given him a task. And Moses still knows that that won't be enough. And you know something? He's right. Everything that we're going to see Moses say to the people is going to be borne out by his experience. He's like, they're not going to believe me. They're not going to believe you. Everything we try to do, they're going to be hard to lead because I grew up with them. I know these people. And I know even the fact that I've been spoken to by God won't be enough to lead these people. Because it's about how a leader is perceived, not because of who they are. Are you guys like me? You like your leaders sweet, bold, and hot? I know I can be very difficult to lead for a person who's not sweet, bold, and hot. If they don't bring me in, if they're not super winsome, if they're not super likable, if they're not bold, they know exactly what they want and how they want to get it done, it can convince me that it makes sense. If they can't show me a winning streak that says they've done it before, I won't follow them. Nine times out of ten, that's true about me. And I can even know that they're right about something, and I still won't follow them. Because I like my leaders, sweet, bold, and hot. Maybe you're like me. So Moses says, who am I? Which means they will only listen to someone they respect. Here's the next thing, sports fans, friends. This is going to be a hard one. They will only listen to someone who says what they want to hear. Look at the passage. Verse 12 
And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God in this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? If I can't answer the question the way that it makes sense to them, they won't follow me. If I don't bring the right answer, they're not going to follow me. Verse 14, God answers that. He says, God says to, said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob has sent me to you. Skip down to chapter 4. Verse 1, Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? If they don't like your answers, they're not going to follow you. Now listen to the next objection, my friends. This is the one that gets me the most, personally. Look at verse 10. Chapter 4, verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent, Neither in the past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, I am slow of speech and tongue. What this actually means, if you look at the, the Hebrew translation, it says he has a stutter. He's got a stutter. Have you ever seen a person with a stutter where they can't get words out and they'll repeat the same syllable again and again and again? They can't quite get the word out. That's what Moses suffers from. So he has a speech impediment. He has a disability. This is something that whenever they do mo movies about Moses, they always get this wrong. They always have Moses be this super strong, powerful, spoken guy. I mean, Charlton Heston, who, he's got a voice that probably, that's probably what God's voice sounds like, right? Charlton Heston. The true Moses is a man that has a speech impediment. He has a stutter. He has a disability. And it's honestly kind of a cruel joke that God comes to him and says, hey, I want you to lead my people. Because he's like, Hey, God, you know that when I get nervous, when I get anxious, I get stuck on my words and I can't get the next syllable out. How are you going to send me to lead these people? Because these people only like their leaders who are hot, sweet, and bold. That's the only people they'll listen to. I can't get a full sentence out. How are you going to send me to speak to these people? My friends, if you put up a person in any church in America that has a stuttering problem, and you make them the senior pastor of a church, like, good luck. Good luck. It could be God sending that person. He could have a word for you, for us, for all of his people, and we won't listen to them unless they're eloquent, unless they're bold of speech, unless they're on a hot streak. Moses isn't on a hot streak. He, had to, he was going to run on a rail out of town, and he's been, he's been, he's been raising sheep. Like, they're not going to listen to me. And you know what? He's right. Because we only want to listen to people who are sweet, who are hot, who are bold. They will only listen to a charismatic speaker. And they will not listen to a person with a disability. My friends, Moses is a level 10 leader. And he does have God speaking directly to him in his ear. And he knows that that won't be enough. Because he knows that us, we, people like us, will only follow somebody that's bold, that's eloquent, that's winsome. And my friends, this is why throughout the church in America and even some other places of the world, why Christ's church is really struggling. Because God will have an anointed leader in a community and the people won't follow him. People won't follow him. If they're not eloquent, if they're not on a win streak, you prove to me that God sent me, and it may be, but the evidence that I'm going to use to figure out if God sent you is that you'll be tall, thin, slim, good-looking, and good at talking. I know I'm that way. So God is trying to send, Aaron, God is trying to send Moses to the people, but the people don't want Moses. And Moses says as much. He says, this is what they're going to say. And he's absolutely right. As we get further into the passage, we're going to see that everything that he says will happen comes true. They are not going to listen. It's not going to be enough that God sent him. And they're not going to listen to him. And what we'll see as we look at the passage, let's look down at verse 11 of chapter 4. The Lord said to him, who gave man his mouth? 
Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? That disability that you have, Moses, I gave it to you. I knew we were going to have this conversation. I gave it to you anyways. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses says, oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. You talk about having stage fright. You talk about having afraid of speaking in front of people. Imagine you've got a disability and then God's going to put you in front of two million people and make you talk in front of a squad like that. And God's like, yeah, I know. I gave you that disability and I'm going to help you. Listen to verse 14. The Lord finally gives in to Moses and says, Then the Lord anger burned against Moses and he said, What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you and his heart will be glad when he sees you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you and it will be as if he were your mouth, as if you were God to him. Isn't it interesting that the people want Aaron? <laughs> like, I don't listen to Moses, but they listen to Aaron. And Aaron doesn't have the character that Moses has. And Aaron doesn't have God speaking directly to him. And Aaron doesn't have these things. But the people will listen to Aaron because he's good at talking. And what we're going to find later on as we go through the book of Exodus, Aaron's going to let the people just run him right off the rails into disobedience. And it's the people's fault because they won't listen to God's man. They want to listen to somebody that's hot, sweet, and bold. Like, God's saying like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with you. I'm going to help you. Mo's like, I, I don't believe it. They're going to want somebody else. He's like, fine, take Aaron. Take Aaron. <laughs> and then we see how Aaron pans out a little bit later. But my friends, I told you when we first started this book of Exodus that this picture of Exodus is about Moses and the Israelites, but it's not just about Moses and the Israelites. It's a picture of how God works with his people. Remember? So in our 30 days to understanding the Bible class, starting May 16, pay attention everybody, we're going to do it again. The Bible starts off in the creation narrative. So God creates a good world and it falls into sin. And then it moves into the era of the patriarchs. You have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, right? And these guys are the ones that God makes a promise. He says, I'm going to save the whole world through this family. And then there's a famine, so their family moves down into Egypt, and the last one of those patriarchs, Joseph, he says, we're going to be slaves here for a long time, 400 years. Is it Jake? Which guy was it? It was Joseph. It was Joseph, wasn't it? It was Joseph, everybody. Check me on that. And then we come into the Exodus. So they're in 400 years of slavery. And this is a picture, this is a picture, this is a picture of our slavery to sin. Remember we said that the Israelites are literally slaves and you and I are slaves to sin. And what we see through the picture of Israel and Moses is that God's going to send somebody to save the people from their sins. This is a picture of what Jesus is going to do in the New Testament. Because Moses is going to come and he's going to do everything he can. Remember, he's going to be the perfect leader. He's going to be gentle. He's going to be humble. He's going to be God's man. He's going to do everything that he can and it still won't be enough. The people are going to leave the land of Israel and they're immediately going to want to go back to slavery. Because remember what we said? Remember we said, when you're a slave, you're enslaved in your mind. And my friends, you and I are slaves to sin in our mind. And this whole picture is to show us what it's going to be like when Jesus comes. And just like the Israelites reject Moses, they reject Jesus, and so do we. See, they didn't want Moses, they wanted Aaron. And when Jesus came, they didn't want him. They wanted a warrior. My friends, I've had conversations with two gentlemen over the last three weeks. The one of them, I was talking with him, and I was telling him about Jesus and things. And he says, well, yeah, I get that. But um, I don't really want to accept God's grace because I'd really rather him worry about people that really need it. Like, I'm, I'm generally a good guy. And yeah, I've got my problems, but I really wish he'd just spend his time on people that need it more than me. I had a conversation with another guy just this week. We're talking about it, and he says, yeah, I understand that God, God can forgive me, but I just can't forgive myself. As if there's like a court that's higher than God's, right? Like God, the ultimate creator, is like, you're like, you know, you get the Supreme Court, and you want to like, uh, you want to appeal that to like a court that you have in your garage or something, like my friends, this is the way that we today even, 
We reject Jesus just like the Israelites rejected Moses. We want to point fingers at those guys and be like, oh, those silly Israelites, they didn't even want to listen. We don't want to listen either. We don't want to listen either. My friends, there are people, even within this church, and throughout the church around the country, I've had, in my time in ministry, I maybe have had a hundred conversations with people in which I've looked in the eye and said, I think God's calling you into serving in his ministry. It may be, for some of them, it's a conversation about going into the pastorate. For others, it's God's calling you to lead within a children's ministry, or God's calling you to teach a Sunday school class, or God's teaching you to disciple, calling you to disciple somebody in your household. And they'll say no. I'll say, why, why, why? And they'll bring up some of the same objections Moses did, but the, the objections aren't Moses' objections. The objections are about the people, because they know how people are. They know how we can be. A person will look at me and they'll say, Pastor, like, you're like sweet of speech. Like you can get people to do anything. I can't do that. People won't listen to me when I ask them to do things. You know what? They're right. Because we won't listen to somebody if they're not sweet of speech. I'll have a person that'll say, Pastor, I'm an introvert. I'm, I'm a person that, that likes to kind of be behind the scenes. And, and because I'm not an extrovert like what you are, if I try to build a team around it, they won't come. They won't be a part of it because I'm more of a quiet person. And people will only follow people that are out there and are bold. And you know what? They're right. We won't follow somebody who's not sweet. We won't follow somebody who's not bold. You have a person that says, Pastor, I made a shipwreck of my life. I just torpedoed my whole thing. I'm not on a winning streak. Why would anybody want to follow me? I'm a loser. And you know what? You're right. They won't follow you. And my friends, this, this, is, a, this is an indictment on us. If God is calling somebody into doing something, whether it be to disciple somebody, whether it be to have somebody over their house for coffee and share Jesus with them, whether it be to lead a Sunday school, whether it be to learn how to teach and preach, whether it be to be a missionary, whatever God's calling a person to do, it's on us that when they look around, they go, they'll never follow me. And it's like, yeah, you're probably right. We probably won't. My friends, can we start here, even as a congregation, not being the people that value the sweet-talking, bold, strong, hot wind streak ones, and start asking the question, if God has put a calling on somebody's life, and they're speaking into that, maybe he intends for us to follow them, even if they don't follow that sticker picture of Aaron. My friends, if you have any concept and you are subscribed to Christianity today, you will see over the last 10 years... Man of God after man of God who are sweet, strong, and bold, and hot go down one after the other. Because we want to follow Aaron. There's two commitments I want for us to consider together. The first is... I will listen to God even when he doesn't use my preferred messenger. I will listen to God even when he doesn't use my preferred messenger. I'm going back and forth about whether to bring this next one to you. I don't know if you've had enough. Do you need one more? You asked for it. Well, Joe asked for it. You guys can <laughs> yell at him later. Look at this. Okay, so we're in three. Go back to chapter three, verse 16. Listen to what God says to Moses. He's very clear, very specific what he wants him to do. He says, Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you out of your misery into Egypt, into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. A land flowing with milk and honey. Listen to this. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you, what's the next word? And... Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. This is meant to be a united front. Abraham, Moses, and all the elders. Now let's watch what really happens. Skip forward to chapter 4, 29. Moses and Aaron, they do their part. 
they brought together all of the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people. Listen to this. And they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. Now, isn't that a pious response? Isn't that a pious response? We believe, Lord. Let's have a worship service. Let's get together and sing about it. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, Remember, God said, take the elders with you. Go as a united front. Oh, we believe. Oh, we believe. Let's have a worship service together. Wonderful. Yeah, you guys, <laughs> let us know how that goes for you. We'll, <laughs> we'll be back here. And then when times get tough, look at 19. So they're going to go. They say to let our people go. Pharaoh gets mad. He gets mad. This is what he does. He goes, Okay, remember all those bricks we made you guys you made you guys build these pyramids and things with? Okay, cool. You remember that? Great. Uh, so what's going to happen is now we're going to make you make your own bricks, and we're not going to give you any stuff to make it with, and uh, have fun with that. And by the way, deliver the same amount of bricks. You guys want to be free? Here's what you get. Okay, so things get tough. Look what the people say. When they, this is Moses and Aaron, left Pharaoh, we're in verse 20 of chapter 5. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. They won't go with them. And when things don't go good, then they sit back and throw judgment on the people that were actually trying to do what God asked them to do. My friends... I'll listen to God even when he doesn't use my preferred messenger. Here's the second one. I will participate in God's movement even when it's hard or dangerous. The elders were invited into the conversation and they didn't go. And then when, and then when things don't go good, then they want to boot. They want to, pull the, they want to pull the escape path. They want to take the escape way out as soon as things get hard. My friends, there are people in this room right now that God's calling to lead something. God's calling them to lead something, and what they're afraid of is that it doesn't go good right off the stop that everybody's going to boot. Everybody's going to jump off sides. Everybody's going to leave them hanging there in the lurch. Are we going to be that people? Are we going to be that people? What if we were the people that even if somebody is a little shy, even if somebody's a little new, even if somebody gets it wrong a couple times and screws some things up and it doesn't go according to plan, can we be the church that won't abandon that leader in the lurch? Like, what if God calls a 16, 17, 18, 19-year-old person to lead something in our church? Are we going to be the ones that go, well, let us know when you've done something. Let us know when you've won something. Let us know when you figure out how to talk in front of a group of people. If you've got a stuttering problem, need not apply. What if we were the church that said, yeah, if God's put a mission on somebody's heart, if God's given, communicated to something and he wants them to do something, yeah, I'm going to get in with them. And even if it doesn't go good, I'm not going to abandon them. And even when it doesn't go good, I'm not going to blame them. What if, what if we said, I will participate in God's movement even when it's hard or dangerous? Listen to John chapter 1. Remember, all of this has been a picture. All of this has been a picture about Jesus. Because I wish we could say that this was only how things worked for Moses. Speaking about Jesus, verse 10. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Friends, even when Jesus walks among them, we don't recognize him. But Jesus has a mission. Remember when we talked together in the beginning? 
He said he gave us this great commission to be about, to reach people who don't know him, to baptize them, to disciple them, to teach them to obey all these things. That's what we're invited into. That's the mission that you and I are invited into. We've got a thing here at the journey where if we've got an event going on and it's a worship thing, we all work for Lisa because she's God's woman for the job there. If Lisa Bristol asks us to help her stuff envelopes, we're all under Lisa Bristol's leadership there. Because if God gives a person a task to do, we're the church that rallies around that person and rallies around that cause. It is not about egos and it's not about who's the smoothest talkers. We are Jesus' church. He is the king of glory and he is the ruler of this church and we follow his lead. That's who we are. Did you know that Jesus is among us? He says that when he came last time, people didn't recognize him. My friends, not, let's not be the ones that ask for Aaron when Moses is sitting right in front of us. Let's not ask for a different savior. Let's not ask to be the ones that say, well, let him work on somebody else that needs it more than me. Let's not be the ones that say, I know that he's forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. Let's bring a gospel to the people around us that more accurately represents who Jesus is. Let's pray together. God, our Father, we come to you through the Lord Jesus Christ by your Holy Spirit. I pray that we will not be a hard-hearted, stiff-necked people that refuse to le follow the leaders that you give us. There are some people in this room right now that are quiet-spoken, that are introverted, that maybe not coming off of a win streak, that you're calling into leading something. I pray that you will give us submissive hearts to your will. I pray that we will have discernment to discern what it is you're calling us to do, but that we will follow God's lead and that we're not looking for Aaron when you're sending us Moses. God, I pray right now for this outreach event we're going to do here in two weeks. It's a silly idea, Lord. It's risky. But God, I pray that somebody, somebody will put their faith in Jesus beginning with the ministry that started on that day. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Stand up, my friends. I want to bless you. May God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you everywhere that you go. May you bring his light into every corner of this dark world. May you go and set with people who don't know the Lord and share with them. May you invite them to things at your house, barbecues, find ways to share the hope that you have with other people. May you not live in shame and guilt anymore, but instead walk in the fullness of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, my friends.